The original Half-Life was a watershed moment in gaming, proving to a whole generation of big-budget developers that you can tell engaging and deep stories without continually wrestling control from the player by creating a hyper-detailed and absorbingly real world in the bones of the Quake engine. Thanks to the hard work of a few plucky designers at the heart of one small Washington State studio, game designing has been changed in ways that reverberate to this very day. Or at least that's what I've read. I don't know. I never played Half-Life. Look, I was a tiny little baby man when Half-Life came out. My entry point into the series was Half-Life 2 on the orange box, and every time I've tried to play Half-Life... Some tools? Explosive! The graphics bounce me right off. I get terrible simulation sickness and I have to stop or I'll vomit. Old games are a lot less forgiving when they move from isometric to first person. I believed everyone when they said that Half-Life was one of the best games ever made, but it just sits there in my Steam library. Unplayed. Unloved. Know the feel, man. Apparently, the developers at Crowbar Collective felt the same way. After Half-Life Source released with the exact same graphical look as Half-Life, not Source, except with wobbly water, one dev said to the other, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we rebuilt the entire Half-Life game in the Source engine the way Valve should have done? Well, 15 years later, they did. And what a result they achieved. Good morning, and welcome to the Black Mesa Transit System. Now arriving at Sector C Test Lab. I've been following this mod turned remake since the teaser for it dropped in 2008. I remember playing the free version of Black Mesa way back in 2012. The look, the feel, the narrative, the pacing, the music, all of it coming together in just one big melting pot of amazing. And it was a free mod that people made in their spare time. Now that's dedication. You know, it kind of makes you think that something being free isn't a defense of it being bad, huh? Finally, I could understand why Half-Life was such a landmark work. I understood why this game was the template for the 22 years of first-person shooters that followed it. It wasn't just boomer gamer grandpa's nostalgia talking when they told me how good Half-Life was in between asking what a TikTok is. And with the release of Zen and updated graphics, Black Mesa's more than a great remake, it's a blueprint for what remakes should do with the source material. Th that wasn't a pun, I promise. Black Mesa is genius, and here's- Oops, Hang on, sorry, I've got post. Sim, you can't say Black Mesa is a way to remake a game if you don't know the thing it's drawing from. You have no idea what a captain sacrificed from the original, and if that hurt or helped the overall experience. You're just taking it as read that this is the automatic way to experience Half-Life. Well, I mean, yeah, but- You should really play Half-Life through yourself so you can understand why it's such a similar work if you want to give each game the credit they're due. I mean, what kind of video essay is this going to be if you don't do your due- Alright, fine, I'll play Half-Life. It's good, right? Yeah, it's really good. Better than Black Mesa? <sighs> no. Look, I think Black Mesa and Half-Life are both good since they share the same core of goodness, but the changes that have been implemented in Black Mesa are interesting to me, and I think they make it a better experience overall, while still retaining the same fun of the original. YouTube only lets you have a hundred character titles, so you know you can't have that much nuance in a video title, otherwise people won't click on- Bollocks to this. We're going with the original title. Black Mesa is genius, and here's why I don't understand why that's a really contentious position. With the release of Half-Life Alex and the promise of more 
Half-Life games on the horizon, there's talk about what the best way for new players to experience Half-Life is, to which the answer is obviously hunt down the Freeman. I think the most concrete thing anyone can tell you is that these are games you absolutely should play. Half-Life has given me an appreciation of just how much gaming has changed and just how much it stayed the same. Many of the praises I sing of Black Mesa just as easily apply to Half-Life, which, you know, would be expected of a remake. Part of why Black Mesa is so great is because it's following in the footsteps of a deservedly seminal work. Rather than determine which of these games is the correct way to get into the series, I think a better discussion should aim to understand why Half-Life is timeless, what changes Crowbar Collective made beyond cosmetics, and why I feel their changes made for the better and make a more interesting experience overall. So, before we can talk about how good Black Mesa is, we have to talk about why Half-Life feels so timeless. And before we can do that, we need to talk about the history of how Valve made their landmark first-person shooter and the core of their game design philosophy. <gasps> <clears throat> okay, history time. Class is in session. Half-Life was born out of the mind vaginas of two former Microsoft employees, Gabe Newell and Mike Harrington, after they left Microsoft and founded the company Valve. They also floated company names like Fruit Fly Ensemble and Rhino Star. Those aren't relevant to our story, those names just tickled me. According to the designer Harry Teasley, Half-Life was inspired by FPS games like Doom, Quake, Stephen King's The Mist, which, that isn't a first person shooter, I should probably, Stephen King's best-selling novella The Mist, and a 1963 episode of The Outer Limits titled The Borderlands. For such a groundbreaking work, one of the things I was surprised to learn was how reluctant the wider community was to publish the game. Apparently Half-Life was too much of a technical risk for most publishers. According to Gabe Newell, in one pitch meeting to sell Half-Life to the publishers, Valve mentioned that they wanted to use skeletal animations in the game, and the publisher said, okay, meeting's over. They didn't believe we could do it. But Ken Williams of, <laughs> no, oh no, that's a very unfortunate name. <laughs> Okay, it was actually Sierra Online who agreed to publish Half-Life, but Sierra is a subsidiary of Cook International, and my version's funnier. Ken Williams and Sierra Online had faith in Valve delivering on the promises Half-Life had made. Based on past articles, the match with Sierra and Valve was a right place, right time sort of thing. Williams said that he viewed Doom as a one-trick pony, and by the time they wanted to explore Doom-like FPS games, Sierra had fallen well behind the rest of the market. The fact that Valve already had a license to the Quake engine and a more or less fleshed out idea meant Sierra wouldn't have to play catch up with other publishers. When Half-Life was shown at E3, it gained a lot of critical buzz with people, citing it as the next big thing in gaming. But inside the studio, Valve, now with working knowledge of the technical parts of the game, decided they needed to rebuild Half-Life from the ground up. The devs threw out just about everything. As Michael Abrash puts it, for Valve, the first year was learning how to do a game, and the second year was applying it. This delayed the game's release substantially. Valve hoped to have the game out in the spring of 1998, then in June, then the summer, then September, and then finally Thanksgiving. Eh, you know, I'm sure huge delays in releasing games won't be something that Valve will make a habit of. <laughs> By the time E3 rolled around in June 1998, Valve was showing off the new and improved Half-Life at Sierra's booth. And in the period where devs were being crunched, soap was being abandoned, and Harrington's beard got, um, beardier, Half-Life's design was recentered around three key pillars. One, triggers for certain scripted sequences and events had to react on the player's timetable. This Hydra attack would only happen when the player walked in to see it. Not before, not after. Two, levels had to be interactable. You see a button? Push it. You see a vending machine? Grab a drink, buddy. You see a delicious microwave casserole? Fuck it up! Three, making sure the player is aware of nearby enemies, like hearing them talk or hearing them teleport in, or through a set piece, or just, you know, with your eyes, to ensure that combat feels fair. These pillars are the formula Valve still uses for making gaming experiences, and perhaps the greatest hallmark of success is longevity. Most gaming experiences today can at least indirectly trace their lineage back to Half-Life and its application of these three design pillars to linear experiences. And these design pillars are ones that Crowbar Collective and Black Mesa follow closely, especially with the Source Physics engine allowing for greater interactivity than before. But if Black Mesa were just a graphical update of Half-Life with nothing else changed, there wouldn't be much reason for it to exist besides saving me from some simulation sickness. I mean, they literally have an in-game scientist engaging in a kind of Socratic dialogue with imagined Half-Life fans giving a thesis statement on why Black Mesa should exist. You should focus on inventing something new and unique. He does have a point. Oh, but this is more than replication, I assure you. For one, it shows how far our field has come since the original study was published and to say nothing of the modern perspective necessary to monitor its influence. Very subtle, guys. 
today's technology, I've recreated. Ah. I can't stand to hear another word of this malarkey. So from these scientists, we can assume that it's more than graphical polish. There's a deeper, more root and stem change to half-life in Black Mesa. Black Mesa wears these on its sleeve too. It is more fundamentally transformative than just a half-life remake, one with its own spins on the story and mechanics, which makes sense. Source is a different beast to the modified Quake engine that Valve used with different strengths and limitations. And we've had more than two decades worth of game design and experimentation to draw from. We should expect these creative changes where it makes sense to accommodate them. Well, I mean, except for mantling and dismantling ladders, apparently. Fuck! The challenge of Black Mesa is to stay faithful to Half-Life without being so faithful as to not modify Half-Life where it makes sense to, or while retaining the same feeling of how Half-Life plays. So, with all of that under our belt, let's talk about what makes these excellent game design foundations and how each game implements them to create an experience that feels grippingly real and immersive. Half-Life was a master in using its design and mechanics to enhance player engagement with its setting. Most games at the time, well, hell, even today, start in media res. You begin right in the middle of the action. It's a good way to hook the player in. Half-Life opens up with a commute to work. Welcome to the Black Mesa Transit System. This tram ride serves two purposes. First, it's showcasing the technical prowess of the engine. So remember how a lot of publishers doubted Valve could actually achieve the technical stuff that they set out to do? Well, this tram ride is Gabe Newell's middle finger pointed squarely at the hashtag haters. Oh, is that a skeletally animated man pounding on a door so he's not late for work? Oh, it is, is it? Put it in a question me again. The tram ride in Black Mesa is a lot longer because the Source engine can do a lot more stuff, technical term. So there's a lot more to showcase, like dynamic lighting and cascaded shadow mapping or bump and specular texture mapping. They also showcase image-based ambient lighting as well. This is where the skybox image has a lighting input so the sky color adds environmental nuance and layering to the environment it's lighting. Source can also create very detailed outdoor environments. Black Mesa doubles Source's displacement limit so they can build larger, more detailed environments than Half-Life 2, which comes in handy with the Zen levels. But you don't just have Half-Life's half-hour commute to work to show off engine prowess. You'll spend the first 20 minutes of the games exchanging pleasantries with other scientists and workers, making alarms go off, ruining delicious microwave casseroles. The world feels reactive, and it feels sensible too. Labs, canteens, the grey utilitarian corridors of Sector C that follow a logical structure and layout. It makes a lovely little bit of world building, and the setting aids characterization. This is a real place, and you're not a super soldier. You're just some guy, a regular person with a theoretical degree in physics who's turned up to do the same job they do most days. The piece of gear that will keep you alive through the entire rest of the game, the HEV suit, that isn't even noteworthy to the other scientists at the start of the game. It's just a thing people wear to work in hazardous environments. Older scientists will comment on how they used to wear the HEV suit for experiments, and they'll tell you about older models that they worked on. The ability for you to talk with other scientists and interact with the world makes you feel like the world is lived in. These people and this setting is believable. And none of this is communicated to the player via cutscene either. I mean, it could have been. This could have been one long cutscene, but locking the player into the shoes of Gordon and not giving Gordon a voice or any other unique attributes beyond what makes sense for the setting helps create a relationship between the environment and the protagonist. For the next few hours, you are Gordon, and like Gordon, you're stuck here too. It demands patience from you. It's this mundanity that makes the experience engaging and immersive. This is, I expect, a fairly accurate depiction of Gordon Freeman's life up to this point. He gets on the tram, goes to Sector C, sits down at his desk, The game trusts your intelligence enough to know that Half-Life wouldn't be much of a game if the experiment went according to plan and Gordon got the bestest results ever. So they include signs that things are going to go wrong. Just one of those days, I guess. Scientists express concern at pushing the limits of the experiment, computers explode. The HEV suit is more than just biomarkers, its heads-up display has weapon loadouts and munitions monitoring. There's a real feeling of being in the calm before the storm here. There's gotta be a more efficient way of saying that. They're waiting for you, Gordon, in the test chamber. Even after the resident cascade Foreshadowing, that's the word. Even after the Resonant Cascade kicks off the events of the game properly, the game retains that sense that you are a scientist trapped in events outside of their control. The first enemy that you encounter, the head crab, is one you can't defend yourself against. You have to dodge past it. The message is clear, both mechanically and thematically, you're not equipped to deal with this. 
A change I really liked between Half-Life and Black Mesa was when you got your first weapon. In Half-Life, you get the crowbar almost right after the Resonance Cascade. Black Mesa delays the weapon for another 10 minutes or so. Instead, you're first escorted by the security guard up to the entrance where you came in. It's the old base hierarchies kicking in, further underlying to the player that you're being thrust into events you're not expected to survive. The game's first weapon, the iconic crowbar, helps symbolize your role as a worker rather than a soldier. Half-Life continues this excellent pacing and narrative throughout, cycling through ever-rising peaks and valleys, and it gives a nice arc to Gordon Freeman's character as well. We start off slow with the tram ride before being hit with the defining event of the campaign, the Resonance Cascade, and then we settle in being escorted by security guards. You're in a horrible survival horror situation, perfectly reflecting the player's stature. But as more and more of the enemies we fight are introduced, we learn how to deal with them. We start thinking we might just get out of Black Mesa alive, we start acquiring weapons to better combat the enemies that are being thrown at us. Then, another big spike as it's revealed the military have arrived to kill everyone and everything on the base. I mean, in retrospect, we probably should have guessed that. This is what their comms guy sounds like. The whole game just drips with this foreshadowing of worse things to come. As we learn to fight back and push further through the facility to stop the Resonant Cascade, we acquire more and more weapons. We get stronger and more skilled as a fighter. We start learning the truth about what Black Mesa was doing. It gets to the point where we're able to deal with whole squads of highly trained soldiers, their tanks, and the invading Xenian forces. This tonal evolution is perfect. There's no awkward gear shift between the modes of story or gameplay being told. It keeps you full fully immersed in the world that it's built. Honestly, the evolution of the player from physicist to fighter is so seamless, you don't even flinch when the Lambda team asks you to travel to another dimension to kill the thing holding the portals to Earth open. Like, yeah, who else are these guys gonna ask? I am literally up to my guts in bloods and brains of literally every other breathing thing in Black Mesa. I'm a highly trained professional. But the game doesn't become non-stop combat with the arrival of the military. Instead, play is broken up between sporadic combat, more intense combat sequences, and down time for solving puzzles or platforming across a sea of health and safety violations. Violation. These segments make sense in the setting of the world. Puzzles are usually turning a switch, restarting a generator, plugging something in. It helps further ground the setting in a place meant to feel real, and it's a good release from the firefights. Valve knew when to hit you with the action and then to slow everything down in the quieter parts of the facility. This continues in Black Mesa. The overall pacing and design builds and feeds off this idea that Gordon is in the midst of a disaster beyond his his control and has to use his wits to survive. This even extends into the most granular parts of the design, the action and the combat. Half-Life is known for teaching you how to play it without explicitly tutorializing you. Button prompts will come up precisely one time when they're needed to tell you a control. Then that's it. The game trusts your intelligence enough to remember what that button does and figure out where it's needed for yourself. In the audio commentary files in Half-Life 2, the devs mention a key Valve principle was that when they introduced a new gameplay mechanic, they'd lock the player in a room until they'd figured out how to do it, and then they'd make them do a slightly more complicated version of that mechanic, and then start introducing those mechanics under pressure. Game Maker's Toolkit talk about how Half-Life tutorializes play using the barnacle example. What's great about it is that it works both as a tutorial and as characterization. If you've played the first Half-Life before Half-Life 2, then you'll know what barnacles are and what they do, and so would Gordon. They'd remember this thing pulls you up on its tentacle and eats you. But if your entry point is Half-Life 2, the game just communicated to you what you need to know without breaking play. No text pop-up required, baby. It's great. Black Mesa does something similar with its barnacles. When you first get out of the test chamber, you have to clear a hallway of debris to get to the lift. Then you're introduced to the barnacles, and after, you meet them next to a barrel. But, remembering the debris from earlier, you might think, hey, I wonder if I can clear my path with this barrel. And Boom! You just figured out you can use objects to clear barnacles. And you can apply the same trick to dumber enemies by getting them to walk into barnacle tentacles and save yourself some ammo. Tutorializing also works in combat, too. Our first introduction to the kinds of things that we'll be fighting, the headcrabs, are when they teleport in and launch themselves at you, so you decide to run through fire because you're not in an emotional headspace to deal with this. Not only does it help instill the idea that to survive, you're gonna need some way to defend yourself, it's a little moment that teaches you sometimes it's smarter to avoid certain 
combat scenarios. We meet the headcrabs again when they teleport into Kleiner's lab. Later, we find the headcrab zombies being shot at by a security guard, and we put two and two together about what these things will do. The game is telegraphing to the player, hey, HR Geiger monsters are going to teleport in at random throughout this game, and these things will attach to your skull and turn you into a forever screaming monster tormented by incomprehensible pain as your ribcage bursts outwards like teeth. So, good luck! Other enemies that we fight are introduced in ways that are relatively safe, usually through set pieces. The hound eyes explode through this glass window, the Vortigaunt's energy blasts a door down, a boar squid is shooting acid at monsters on the other side of a room. One of the earlier chapters, Office Complex, is dominated by Vortigaunts and headcrabs, and this is where you first acquire a shotgun. When you engage Vortigaunts, you'll know that your starting pistol is a bit too weak to dispatch large groups of them. You also learn that their ranged attacks are slow to fire, and when they start their attack, they're locked into it for a few seconds, which gives you time to evade, flank, or my personal favourite, rush him with a shotgun. Now you know speed is an effective way to handle Vortigaunt groups, and you learn when to pull back and pick your moments to engage them. Later on in the game we're introduced to the Ichthyosaur as it leaps out of the water to devour the scientist. Moving forwards, this event is going to be in the back of our minds when we see a pool of deep water. We're going to be wary of just jumping in there. Then, when you get a crossbow, you're plunged into the same Ichthyosaur infested waters inside a shark cage. This cage helps give you some protection, and it's a teachable moment. You know the crossbow is a powerful weapon that can fire underwater. Next time you jump into a pool of murky water, you're gonna have your crossbow equipped. My favourite example of this is at the start of We've Got Hostiles, where this scientist just runs into a trip mine and explodes. There. Blue laser equals danger. As you get familiar with the enemy traps and their attacks, they're gradually introduced in more high pressure ways, and you get better at navigating and dealing with them, all of it culminating with you expertly crouch jumping through an entire room filled with trip mines and high ordnance explosives, only to then walk headfirst into a really obvious trip mine and blow up Black Mesa. It's a great example of getting the player to perform tasks that get progressively harder. The game is telling you, hey, if you're not paying attention, you're gonna run into problems, and if you don't apply what we're teaching you, you're gonna suffer. You're smart, figure it out. The game is really good at using this simple formula to keep you on edge and recontextualize play. There's so much you need to be aware of to stay alive, and the game is always introducing additional ways for you to die while providing the game space to learn what tactics and approaches will serve you best. Even if the game keeps the same basic control throughout, no one strategy will see you through the whole thing. This is especially true for enemies like the soldiers, who show up at the end of the game's first act. Okay, do you remember Jurassic Park? Okay, you know when you watch Jurassic Park now and the CGI modelling still looks super good even though it was made in 1993? They do move in herds. Well, this is what I was thinking of when I encountered the military AI in Half-Life 1. See, you can learn certain patterns with enemies in Half-Life to make fighting them easier. The military are a lot less predictable than the Zen creatures you were fighting up until this point. Soldiers will run, they'll take cover, they'll flank you. If you camp in cover too long, they'll throw grenades at cover to force you out of it. And if you stay still and don't fire back, they'll send people out to check and make sure you're dead. And they have squat formations and mechanics. Right. It turns out there was an active focus by Valve on the AI to make enemies feel like they could plan and react to what you did as a player. YouTuber Marfitimus Blackamus had a playlist about Half-Life facts, and according to the in-game code, the AI was even programmed to react to different smells. Valve achieved this solid AI through quite a basic set of queries and schedules written in C. If condition X is fulfilled, do Y, else move to task 2. If condition V is fulfilled, do Z. In action, it'd be, look for the enemy, if found, target, and then run through a priority list of enemies to fight first, else, listen for enemy, if heard, search, if in squad, see player, telegraph player position to squad, and so on. Valve also had condition breaks that would interrupt this simple process and load a new schedule, like if shot, move to cover. It sounds really basic when I say it out loud, but in an industry where they still can't program AI, having a shooter from 1998 that has responsive AI even for its cockroaches is just so amazing to see. Another dimension of what makes combat feel so good in Half-Life comes from its engine limitations. One of the ways Half-Life used the limitations of the engine to its advantage was building action around the simple geometry of a level. Large crates and pillars provide cover for marines to move to, and because of the code tree, it gives way to what the player will perceive as flanking behaviours. Soldiers would often have their backs to you, so you had more time to get the jump on soldiers or duck into cover. In surface tension, you could use tunnel systems to get the jump on soldiers, and because of the blocking geometry of the level and the positioning of the soldiers, they couldn't alert their squad mates to your presence. Because enemies in Half-Life couldn't move and shoot, and because being shot interrupted their code tree, it allowed the player some 
Respirite to either find cover and get health or press their advantage in combat. It made enemy encounters feel a lot more tactical. You were picking your moments to shoot and planning approaches ahead of time. It helped underline this feeling of Gordon surviving on a combination of ingenuity and luck, using his intellect and cunning to learn and adjust strategy on the fly. Black Mesa and the Crowbar Collective have a much tougher time getting their eye in for the AI and for balancing combat to meet the same thematic purpose. Since a lot of Black Mesa is tight corridors, they could use the same trick Half-Life did to give the players a sense of using their own wits and ingenuity to get an upper hand. Hound eyes can often be found sleeping in clusters like this, so rather than take them out in a potentially costly gunfight, the player can quietly roll a grenade, duck behind the corridor, and... This trick works great for fighting the military too. You often have them walking with their backs to you, which means you get to do this. <laughs> oh, shit. Yeah. Surface tension retained the pipe system from Half-Life to move around. While you can't exploit the AI limitations like you could in Half-Life, you can still use the tunnel system to your advantage. If you were Gordon, you probably wouldn't go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a heavily armed military squad in a tank. That'd probably be a bad time. By moving around the tunnels, you have more opportunities to take out soldiers without taking fire and make the engagement more manageable. Like when I used a grenade to kill these schmucks and then snuck around to blow up the tank before it could reorient its turret. Don't fuck with the science Black Mesa leans on Design Pillar 3 for many of its encounters with the military, where you're often alerted to their presence before you engage in combat with them. But you're not given so much time as to create a fully fleshed out plan of attack, and you often don't have a full lay of the land, which forces you to improvise. You often feel like you're thinking on your feet in Black Mesa, like in Power Up where the military comes down the lift. I tried to use the time before they saw me to set up a series of trap explosives to catch them off guard, but then they didn't show up so I had to use a grenade instead. Here's YouTuber Sexy Nutella demonstrating what I mean. Black Mesa is more than just right-angled corridors, though. The Source engine really shines at creating large open spaces, which can disrupt the simple geometry trick that Half-Life 1 used. On top of that, the AI is very different in Black Mesa than in Half-Life. Black Mesa started off basing enemies on the Combine AI from Half-Life 2, except they were more likely to flank and use grenades to flush you out of cover. One big change is giving the soldiers the ability to fire while moving, another thing introduced in Half-Life 2. This means that you have less of an opportunity to get the upper hand in combat. There are fewer opportunities to press your advantage and fewer moments of respite when you get into firefights with soldiers thanks to their ability to run and shoot at the same time. Now, I don't want to tell people complaining about Black Mesa's combat to just get good. <laughs> Hell, I'm bad at video games. In residue processing, I died four times in the exact same way. The military conflicts are a lot harder, and they can go south pretty fast, but while Black Mesa's combat is unforgiving, it's also fair. To compensate for the AI changes, open environments in Black Mesa have more potential places for cover, and those areas tend to have ammunition and health stocks. The outdoor area of the rocket silo in Honor Rail demonstrates this nicely. There are far more opportunities for cover where you can move and flank soldiers, and machine gun nests that allow you to crouch behind cover while returning fire. The game also teaches you to use the environment to your advantage. When you emerge from the test chamber without a weapon, you can use emergency flares to light zombies on fire or ignite gas leaks to create walls of fire. A firewall. In conflicts where cover is less available, like the start of surface tension, you have explosive barrels around the environment. Execute it right, you can use the environment to take out the bulk of the forces and then move in to pick off the stragglers. Later on in surface tension, you can choose to bypass combat altogether, like when I let the alien forces destroy the Osprey and the M2A3 and then hit their little cluster with a guided rocket. Or like in the car park where I just left the army to it and used a bounce pad to get the hell out of there. Ooh. I'm sure he'll find his way to a hospital. Another big change between Half-Life and Black Mesa is the amount of ammo you get and the overall clip sizes of certain weapons, and this is where I risk getting a little bit hashtag controversial. Megamind Ian Danskin, aka Innuendo Studios, did a video on what makes an FPS arsenal good, so I'm not going to cover it in too much depth here. The footnotes version is that a big weapons arsenal will come with trade-offs and will be appropriate for certain situations. If designed well, the entire weapons arsenal will cover the whole game where each weapon gets their time to shine. If they're designed poorly, then you'll 
either have weapons which are all purpose or dead zones where you can't find anything appropriate. Half-Life and Black Mesa both have big arsenals typical of 90s shooters, but in Half-Life you get a lot more ammo. For the MP5 you get 50 bullets to a clip and 250 bullets overall with 10 launched grenades. The shotgun has 125 max ammo and the Magnum has 36 bullets. The crossbow has about 50 total shots. Half-Life's MP5 has great sound design. It feels really thumpy and powerful as it just sprays bullets. Okay, I'm sure you noticed. So I use the HD models in my Half-Life footage, so my footage is of the M4 instead of the MP5. In the non-HD texture version, it's an MP5. It's just easier to call it an MP5 to do a direct comparison between the games. My point still stands about the sound design. It's a cosmetic thing, it's just... I'm not gonna read a gajillion comment about how I called a gun wrong, okay? Like, go outside, touch grass, like I'm doing as I record this. Combined with the fast movement speed that Half-Life has, this made for a lot of run and gun fun. But a consequence of this was that I didn't switch beyond my immediate loadout unless I had to. My gameplay in Half-Life was dominated with the MP5 and the shotgun. Black Mesa slows the player's move speed way down and knocks down the ammo for the main loadout. MP5 ammo goes down to 30 rounds a clip and 150 rounds overall. Roll. Your MP5 launch grenades have a limit of 3 now. The shotgun goes down to 64 shells overall, the magnum goes down to 18 bullets, and the crossbow to 15 shots. And they're changed reload times, so the crossbow takes longer to reload, and so does the shotgun. The shotgun also fires more slowly, and the MP5 has a greater amount of spread, making it more suited for mid-range combat. All of these changes mean that you can't play Black Mesa like you'd play Half-Life. If you rely too heavily on your MP5, like I'm doing here, you're gonna need to reload midway through firefights, which not only only means there are spaces where you're not firing, but enemies can get a lot of easy hits on you. You can see I'm barely getting out of this firefight because I'm not changing between my weapons. By changing up my weapons, the confrontation is a lot easier, and by reducing reliance on the MP5, it allows the individual merits of each weapon to shine through more clearly. Every weapon is useful in Black Mesa. The crowbar is a way you can break crates for goodies without wasting ammo, and it's a good way to kill slower one-on-one -on -one enemies while preserving more ammunition. Your starting pistol is good for long-range shots where you need to be accurate and to conserve ammo. The shotgun does big damage at close range and favors situations where you need to be aggressive. The MP5 is a good way to put out consistent damage and its grenade launcher is a nice handy safety net if you fuck up. The Magnum and Crossbow are good long range high damage weapons that you can use to clear out areas before you advance and the Magnum is a faster high damage weapon for scenarios where you need to fire quickly at range like in firefights. The RPG is good for tanks as well as groups of enemies and the rocket can be steered which makes it good for fighting helicopters in surface tension. The high hand can save you in a pinch if you're low on health and ammo because it allows you to return fire from behind cover and know that you're gonna hit something, as well as a secondary fire sequence that can put out damage fast. Snarks can be used to disrupt squad formations and make big confrontations easier. The gluon gun is a really useful tool when you just need to unload on something. The Tau Cannon is a unique way to deal accurate damage against enemies and vehicles. Now both styles of play serve their respective games well, but for me, Crowbar Collective retains the unique attributes of these weapons while reconfiguring the ammunition of the weapons that the player would use the most. Ammo is just sparse enough to encourage you to switch up the weapon that you're using without being so conservative with ammunition that you struggle in fights. You can take chances and calculated risks, but the game will punish you if you fail to adapt. It helps give combat this nice flow where style of play works in service of progressing the story. It's designed to capture the tagline of the original Half-Life, run, think, shoot, live, just apply to the source engine, and it makes combat feel really dynamic and satisfying. Also, I, I just thought I'd be remiss to not point this out. Uh, special weapons with special attributes can be tutorialized too. When you first get introduced to the Tau Cannon, it almost blows your head off, and it's a nice way of showing the player that it can shoot through thin walls. Also, it shows that you can charge your shot for more damage, but don't let it overcharge. What do you mean overcharge? Oh, I love it. You just go into this room, this guy's just smoking boots. Ah, uh, I love these games. This teaching without specifically teaching and keeping the player firmly grounded in Gordon's perspective helps feed into probably the best part of the Half-Life genre, a phenomenon I like to call...
stain play. I coined that word, that word's mine. I've got patent pending on that. Stain play refers to the ways a well-crafted and deep story is integrated with gameplay in a way where you can choose your level of engagement with the story without sacrificing the overall experience. Dark Souls is a really good example of stain play. There are a few cutscenes and little exposition. The information that you're given at the start is that the world is dying and you, a cursed undead, are destined to link the flames and restore the world by killing all the demons and gods of old. Most of this story is conveyed through the environment. They're huge and cavernous, many are decaying or falling apart to create a sense of picking through the ruins of a once mighty world. Analondo, the city of the gods, has these really big gothic buildings and it's bathed in sunlight. It makes it feel grand and powerful and it sharply contrasts it with the more dour parts of the world that we've been moving through. But if you say, I don't know, shoot Guinevere after beating Ornstein and Smo, then a whole new part of the story is revealed to you. Analondo, the city of the gods, is a lie. The bright rays of the sun maintain through illusions. The titans who guard the grand halls aren't titans at all. They're really just the last few people keeping the lights on. The gods of old really did abandon the world to die. It's deep and it's sad and it's brilliant. And the best part is, you don't have to think any of this. You don't even have to discover Anno Londo is maintained by illusions to have a good time. I literally did this just to see if the game space would let me shoot big titty goth girlfriend. And it did. Like, doing this just rewards you with more bosses to kill. Yeah! They gave the player freedom in the game space they crafted, thought about what would happen if someone used it, and then made it an opportunity to further underline the themes of Dark Souls. See, you don't have to pay attention to Dark Souls' story to have a good time. The challenge of killing big hard bosses and leveling up is engaging enough as a loop on its own, and the aggression of the roll-dodge-strike strategies needed to kill most bosses requires enough finesse to be really absorbing gameplay. You can play Dark Souls disengaged from the story, or you can absorb yourself in the lore, and both are fulfilling experiences. Now that is good stain play. Other games like Hades, the best game of 2020, don't at me, it just is, deploy this method too. You can play Hades and be rewarded for paying attention to the story, or you can play Hades without engaging with the story and still have a lot of fun just going through dungeons and killing bosses. Doom 2016 is another good example. Early in Doom, you run into a um, evil corporation man, and midway through his speech, Doom Guy just tosses the iPad aside, which is great characterization, but also a real big middle finger to the cinematic experiences a lot of games want you to have. Doom is a really basic story. An evil corporation uses hell energy to power Earth and solve the energy crisis. Demons break out of hell, you are the contingency plan in case demons break out of hell get to work. And that's it. If you want to find out the lore and read up on the world and how it works and who you are like some kind of nerd, you can do that and gain a greater appreciation of the world and its setting. Or not. And the experience of Doom is still great. As far as I can tell, Half-Life is the pioneer of the stain play method. It's the Dark Souls of FPS shooters. <laughs> hey, where'd you get that crowbar? Like Doom, the story of Half-Life is deceptively simple. Yeah, 40 minutes in and we're finally getting to the plot. Ugh, girl, you have done it again. Constantly raising the bar. You are Gordon Freeman, theoretical degree holder who pushes a mysterious rock into a thumping laser machine, causing a rip in the fabric of space-time and an interdimensional alien invasion. And that's it. Kill everything that wants you dead. It's good luck. But pay attention to the background details. The story takes on a lot more dimensions. Ha, <laughs> do you get it? Dimensions? Like, like, dim oh, fuck it. See, Black Mesa is actually a government facility looking into teleportation technology. The Lambda team have been developing said technology and have discovered a border world called Zen that they can teleport to as they move between dimensions. After the resonance cascade, the government try and cover up the event with the military wiping out everything at the base to prevent a public panic. To close the resonance cascade, you help the lander team fire a rocket. However, it doesn't work. If anything, the aliens show more organized invasion after the rocket launch. Alien teleports become less random and we begin meeting alien soldiers. When you finally reach the surface again, the military aren't able to hold off the invading alien forces, making the possibility of an Earth-wide invasion a near certainty. Come in, Cooper. Do you copy? Forget about Freeman. We're abandoning the base. Turns out the rocket didn't work to close the bridge to the border world because they're being deliberately held open by an ultra-powerful creature called the Neolinth, whose growing Xenian force is being sent to Earth using Vortigaunt slave labor. But as you debate the Neolinth on workers' rights in the marketplace of ideas, if you look at the Neolinth, it has shackles round its wrist. The Neolinth is enslaved as well. Between that and a Neolinth whispering to you as you traverse Zen, Rest, I am the man. 
The game implies that the Xenian creatures invading Earth aren't focused on conquest, they view Earth as a refuge from something far worse. The Resonance Cascade gave them the chance to escape Zen. When you fired the rocket and closed the portal to Earth, it forced Anil in's hand. If it didn't start a full invasion, it and everything else in Zen would be slaughtered by the entity that enslaved it, which is why the rocket fails and why there's much greater organization by the Xenian forces after the rocket launch. And shadowing you the entire game, the enigmatic blue-suited G-Man watching everything. The mystery of the G-Man has always been part of the fun of the game, neither a help or hindrance to the player, instead acting at the behest of his employers, whoever they are, the deep state I guess. He appears arguing with scientists shortly before the resonance cascade and can be spotted throughout Black Mesa after the event. How much of a hand he had in the disaster is never made explicit. And this is where the second design pillar becomes important. The game tells its story by flowing into scripted sequences that are integrated as part of the game rather than as a cutscene intermission, which allows the player to choose how invested they want to be in the world and setting. All that stuff I said about being being in a world beyond your control and themes about being a plucky scientist just trying to survive against government cover-ups and interdimensional conflict? Well, you don't have to pay attention to any of that to have a good time. I mean, you can ask questions about who the mysterious man in a blue suit is who follows you through the Earthbound maps. You can wonder what role he played in these events, why he needs to be in control of a border world, who his employers are, whether his employers are apparatchiks of the deep state and why he wants to harvest your adrenochrome, or not. You might not even notice his presence until he offers you a job at the end of the game. That's fine. You might feel relief at every friendly face you meet and make it your solemn duty to keep them safe. Or you might make the military look like pacifists. I, uh, I heard screams up ahead. I can't. What are you still doing down here? Oh, right? It doesn't appear that you have any trouble killing things. You can... Crap. The environments are a key part of making Half-Life and Black Mesa's stain play work to sell you on the story. Half-Life has great environmental storytelling. Chapters have their own unique aesthetics and designs to make each part of Black Mesa feel unique in a way that's only better presented in Black Mesa with the increased poly count and better rendering on offer. Black Mesa resists the temptation to remove the uniqueness of each area or jam polygons on the screen because they can. The spirit of each location is maintained, whether it's the early labs, the wood panelled offices, or the cavernous bowels of the facility. Part of the way the introduction and opening levels lay the groundwork for creating something that feels so real and immersive is in the level design. Although it's a linear experience, Black Mesa has a lot of rabbit warrens and dead ends, usually with some sort of goodies at the end. These warrens and places to explore never feel odd. They make sense in the context of the facility being a working laboratory. The environmental storytelling sets the tone too. When you first step out of the test chamber, you see the scientists giving desperate CPR to people who are injured. Electronic eye scanners are glitching out as well as doors. Lifts fall with people trapped in them. It feels like a real disaster. It's dark, nothing works, and alien horrors are warping into the facility. It's a nightmare. My favourite environmental storytelling is with the military. When they first show up in We've Got Hostiles, they're organised, they use traps, they set up sentry turrets, they're aggressive, and they'll use their AI to the fullest extent to make your life a living hell. When you reach the surface, while the fight isn't overly difficult if you move fast and use your cover well, the osprey and mortar fire that rains down will force you back underground. Without breaking the flow of gameplay, the devs have successfully communicated to you that the military are in control now, and the surface isn't safe. For the next few hours, the army is fully in control. Your resistance to them makes you the prime focus of their efforts. They start setting up traps for you and writing your name on the walls in the blood of Black Mesa personnel. We start getting hints that the military is having troubles pacifying Black Mesa. First, it's with the gargantuan wiping out a whole squad of soldiers. Then, the odd headcrab soldier begins appearing with IV drips still in arm. Then you start seeing the military get into firefights with zombies and struggle to fight them off. By the time questionable ethics ends and surface tension starts, soldiers are everywhere. One of the main changes between Half-Life and Black Mesa that I really like is the amount of soldiers you encounter in surface tension. There's only a handful of soldiers between you getting the Tau Cannon and fighting the helicopter in Half-Life, but in Black Mesa, you have way more confrontations with the military to totaling around 30-odd soldiers. It makes it feel like the military is still in de facto control of the region, and that their grip is tightening. But as you progress and push back into the facility, you see their situation degrade. Up until this point, we'd been mostly fighting disorganized ball squids and hound eyes. Surface tension is the story of how the situation is escalating. The Vortigaunt and alien grunts are making coordinated attacks against the soldiers, who are struggling to organize against an enemy that can teleport in on them at random. This is something the original Half-Life really didn't sell me on. 
I suspect it's because of the limitations of the Quake engine, but I never felt that the tide was turning against the soldiers. Black Mesa and the Source engine really convinces me that humanity is fucked. The end of questionable ethics and the start of surface tension has this clear blue sky, but as you progress, the sky changes. It starts filling with dust and smoke. As you go further still, the lighting takes on a rich orange. Now you can't even see the sky anymore. Smoke can be seen all across the map, just plumes of it coming from the destroyed buildings you're crawling through. Jets roar overhead, bombing the facility to smithereens. You see enemy air sweep over the map. Radio broadcasts from other soldiers are saying they're being overwhelmed and no one's there to answer them. You hear one guy bleed out on the radio. It's clear the tide is starting to turn against the military. It's chaos out here. Eventually, the military conclude that Black Mesa is a lost cause and begin pulling out of the facility, covering their retreat with airstrikes. They're evacuating the entire state of New Mexico, implying the portal storms created by the resident cascade aren't just confined to Black Mesa. Their losses are so heavy, they're not even trying to evacuate soldiers on the ground anymore, figuring it'd be an exercise in getting more lives wasted. By the time you get to the last big confrontation with the military and forget about Freeman, the sun is setting. The sky is filled with the howls of enemy air as they strafe the last remnants of the soldiers left behind. The casualties that the military sustained and the amount of troops left behind illustrating just how poorly they were able to get their men out of there and just how in control the Zen forces now are. The gameplay really aids this too. There's very few breaks in between combat segments in Surface Tension and virtually no puzzles for the player to solve. Having such a combat dominated chapter really underscores just how much of a war zone Black Mesa has become. And the best part of this is thanks to Stainplay, you can immerse yourself in the military losing controls that surface as alien forces show more organized invasion, pondering the implications of what it means that the military realizes Black Mesa is a lost cause and start bombing the place to recover their retreat and how many soldiers they're abandoning to die, or your engagement with all of this effort on display can be Stingray go <laughs> and nothing is lost from your experience. It's great. These chapters really have it all. They're some of the longest chapters in Black Mesa, but they don't feel like they overstay their welcome. The story just unfolds in this really neat and satisfying way. I'll replay Questionable Ethics all the way through to Forget About Freeman just to experience these things again. The redesigns really shine here. The labs in Questionable Ethics look a lot more real. The creatures being experimented on have comprehensive notes on whiteboards. They've included lockers and a cafeteria for workers, almost like a real lived office would. And the pacing is just fantastic. You wander through the laboratories in this creepy atmospheric setting where the scope of what Black Mesa has been doing becomes more apparent. You get into tussles with the military, you see them lose control, and then it ends with this final tense firefight with the military as aliens just scream overhead. And all of this is shown to you in gameplay rather than told in exposition. Just, mwah. Environmental storytelling and redesigns change parts of the game gameplay in Black Mesa for the better, in my opinion. In Power Up, the chase sequence with the Gargantuan is shortened. Crowbar Collective wanted the player to find the power console first, so they knew that they needed to use the discharge from the Transformers to kill the Gargantuan, and at the start of the confrontation, the Garg knocks out power in the lower levels by destroying some of the Transformers when it falls back into them. Moving through the lower levels is much tenser as a result. You only have your torch with you, and the soldiers have night vision and flares. It's so gripping and such an interesting change. And the music, oh man, I haven't even talked about the music and sound design yet. Joel Neeson did the sound design in this game, both music and effects, and it really shines here. I don't think there's a more skilled or dedicated sound designer working in the industry currently. Case in point, this interview answer about how he slapped his wife's wet ass to get the perfect sound of walking on fleshy surfaces. Oh, God bless you, Joel, you beautiful man. Aesthetics is a really important part of designing games and shooters. A shotgun or magnum that that feels loud and thumpy will feel very different to play than ones from other games where they feel softer, even if they serve identical functions. Black Mesa gives the guns a better feel than Half-Life, while retaining some of the more fun parts of Half-Life's design. The Tau Cannon has recoil at high charges, making it feel like a really powerful, unwieldy weapon, especially when you use it to destroy a tank or armored vehicle. The glue on guns animation has Gordon wrestle control over the weapon's kickback, and the sound of these guns just really helps sell you that they are powerful like, just listen to how good the glue on gun sounds.
The Magnum feels heavy and crisp. The shotgun is loud and jibs enemies. So you often have this squelchy jibbing combined with this hard thump when you use it in combat. Some of the sounds are less satisfying. The MP5 in Half-Life feels much better to use and almost all of that is due to the sound design. Black Mesa's MP5 sounds a little softer and feels kind of underpowered. I don't know. I think it works for what it is. I think it acts as a further incentive for players to switch combat styles. Sometimes you want something with a bit more punch, and by giving the MP5 less punch in its sound design, it might mean that players make more use of the vast arsenal that they're given. But that might just be my hippie hipster pretentious credentials kicking in. Another big change is the music. Joel Neeson has gone on the record to say that the design of the music leans closer to Half-Life 2 than Half-Life 1. You're like, we're creating Half-Life 1, but the goal was to make it so you could flawlessly kind of jump into Half-Life 2 from our game and it wouldn't seem like it was like this different you know completely different experience so right like like goal wise i kind of was pushing toward half-life 2 a little bit more maybe than half-life 1 which means that there's a lot more techno, industrial, and drum and bass sounds. One thing worth noting is the lack of ambient background music outside of a few key moments. Black Mesa's soundtrack will make its presence and absence felt. There's long stretches of the game where you're carried by the gentle sound of clapping cheeks, I mean walking the creaking and leaking facility, and the distant firefights rather than any music. It helps steep the environment in this really thick atmosphere. The sound aliens make when they teleport in is really iconic, and it's so distinctive from anything else you'll hear in the game which conditions you to listen out for the teleportation noise, and when you hear it, prepare for a fight. Like when I hear this teleport noise and a hound eye has just warped in right behind her. It's another way Valve and Crowbar Collective ensure fights feel fair, even if they're challenging. When the music does start up, it's varied enough to work in surface of how each individual chapter and segment plays, rather than tying itself to one genre. Most of the techno music centers around the banging of a kick drum to give the music a pulse, and Joe uses this to great effect for combat segments of Black Mesa to help sculpt a sense of flow and momentum. I'd love to show you my footage to illustrate what I mean, but uh, my footage had to go back to its home planet, so I'm just going to use Sexy Nutella's video instead. Man, Sexy Nutella is really good at this game. It deserves way more love on YouTube. The sound design really comes through in the Zen levels. A lot of the music for Zen has this really ethereal singing with the reverb amped up, along with these deep, naturalistic drums and assorted synths. It's a complete contrast with the preceding Earthbound music. The melodic and angelic singing in a lot of those songs communicates this beauty of the border world. Interloper's opening soundtrack in the Alien Factory really makes you feel like you're just trespassing somewhere forbidden. The music is just so hauntingly beautiful. The first time I heard it, I just stood and listened. And well, I guess we can't put off talking about Zen any longer, can we? No one liked Zen. If you think you liked Zen, you didn't. At least, that's what I've read on the internet. And you know what, they're right. Zen sucks. <coughs> 
I mean, thematically, I can see what they're going for. Half-Life's success is in how absorbingly real it feels. You find guns lying on the ground or on the bodies of enemies, and enemies will react in ways that you'd expect them to. Combined with the opening sequence and environmental design we've already talked about, it creates what feels like a hyper-real experience. The final part of the Earthbound segment is leaping into a portal to take you to the alien world, Zen. So creating an environment that was alien to the player makes sense. As such, Zen has completely different rules and gameplay styles, and the environment design is meant to showcase that, like floating rock platforms that seemingly defy physics. I don't have too much of a gripe with the change in the mechanics here. Like I said, I think they work thematically, and these sorts of changes occurred in the Earthbound maps for the same sort of reasons. But Zen in the OG Half-Life is just so sparse, and it looks so monotonous and drab and boring. It doesn't feel like a space that's lived in in the same way the Black Mesa facility feels like it's used by scientists. And the wider lore told through the environment really suffers here as well. You'll find some HEV suits that will suggest that Black Mesa have travelled to Zen before, but nothing that corroborates what was implied by questionable ethics. And even if I'll defend the shift in mechanics and play, it still feels really clunky and awkward. And given how much fun a long jump module could add to movement in a game with fast-paced movement and platforming, it, I, I don't know, it feels like a really missed opportunity. Community. Zen doesn't feel like a payoff to the build-up the Earthbound segments of the game had crafted. It's like Valve hit their head on a pipe and forgot how to design games. Which means the challenge for Black Mesa and the Crowbar Collective is to transform Zen into something entirely new while retaining the strength of Half-Life, i.e. these three pillars of game design and ensuring that they maintain the same sort of flow to the Earthbound levels. Crowbar Collective knocked Zen out of the park. Black Mesa Zen was delayed a solid four years from the 2015 release of the Earthbound maps, and it's actually built on a hyper-modified version of the Source engine that they licensed from Valve. It's like poetry, it's sort of they rhyme. And man, are they making the engine work here. The vistas on display are just jaw-droppingly beautiful. I mean, I... I it, Look at this! Look at this! The lighting here is mesmerizing. Starlight scattered by the nebula bathes the entire area in this deep purple glow, made even more alien for the blue haze that comes off the healing pools and energy crystals that replace the medical and suit recharging stations. Caves are lit up with this bioluminescent glow of turquoise plant life. The environments all have their own unique looks and feelings. The impossible floating rocks confirming your off-world give way to a dark horror sci-fi of the destroyed forward research base which gives way to this jungle that feels heavily inspired by aquatic biomes for the otherworldly look. Fauna shrouds the ferocious beasts waiting to hunt you down, in a staunch contrast to the sparse and barren look of the original. Platforming is a lot more varied and suits the setting better as well, changing between floating rocks and launch platforms to the giant lily plaids and leaves as the presence of the science team becomes less felt. I also like the introduction of landing jets to avoid fall damage. In Half-Life I'd often die after misjudging the height or distance to a platform. This feature makes platforming a lot more fun by virtue of me dying less. It then gives way to these big basalt columns, bathed in this deep red light when you reach the Gonark fight, before moving into the dark, dank caverns and crystal caves of Gonark's lair. Rocks are just covered in this webbing just slung across the walls like old spider's webs. It makes it really quite creepy. The Vortigaunt village also feels suitably alien. They really push the environmental storytelling to better tie up the threads Half-Life left dangling too. Whereas in Half-Life seeing some of the other HEV suits was meant to suggest you weren't the first person here, and the science team had been dimensional hopping for some time now. Black Mesa Zen takes it to a whole new level. You have teleporter pads, boxes and boxes of equipment, launch pads, scientific instruments to monitor the atmosphere and layout of Zen, you know, proper infrastructure and shit. They even have signs and doormats that ask you to wipe your feet at the remnants of the research base set up by the other science team. It's such a great little touch.
Later, when you fight through the Vortigaunt villages, care was taken to actually create a noticeable difference in the Vortigaunts who are forced to fight you and those who have control of their minds, which is always a problem in the original Half-Life. It was never clear which Vortigaunts were actually going to be hostile until they started shooting at you, which undermined the idea that fights should feel fair. But in Black Mesa, they cower in fear from the grunts and controllers, and controllers have these blue beams connecting their minds to the Vortigaunts, almost like leashes. The Vortigaunts even wear collars. You get a sense that these creatures really are actually kind and caring, but are just being subjugated by the violence and powers that have enslaved them. And it gives you an indicator of which Vortigaunt will cause problems, so you can decide if you want to take them out alongside the controllers or not. At the center of it all, Zen's Eye of Sauron. This thing will ground your journey through Zen, a visible landmark steadily getting closer, a constant reminder of why you're here, what your mission is, and just how inescapably small you are. And we've got to talk about the sound design for the environments again. The noises made by the wildlife here really feel alien, like nothing you'd expect to hear at the New Mexico Mesa. Apparently Joel Neeson took regular animal sounds from Earth and then ran them through a processor to mangle them beyond all recognition. It really works. It masterfully adds to the feeling of Zen being this completely alien realm. My favorite is how they changed the meaning of the Zen teleportation sound. The Earthbound maps condition you to listen out for those noises because they signify danger, but in Zen, the noises correspond to care packages being sent from Earth. In Half-Life, you were largely alone during the final few levels, and it, it kind of made it feel like the science team had too much faith in you, like there was no contingency plan in case you died, and it also meant that I was consistently running low on ammo. In Black Mesa's Zen, it really feels like the Lambda team are actually tracking you and sending help where they can. They even send through radio broadcasts about what's going on back home. Little reminders about why you're here and why you need to keep going. It's such a nice detail. Crowbar Collective really captured the thematic essence of Zen here, and to complement the vastly different visual look it has, it vastly alters the tone and gameplay style compared to the Earthbound levels. I mean, I have gripes, I keep getting caught up on terrain, and people complain about Interloper being way too long, which, yeah, Interloper definitely overstays its welcome. But honestly, the design of the alien factory was just so compelling and stunning, I didn't mind all that much. I love seeing the Vortigaunt villages and crawling around the internal factories where they grow the grunts. It's got this really cool aesthetic where they merge flesh and industry. The walls look like they're made of skin. They have faint veins protruding through them with thick black wires puncturing the flesh like stitches, as if it was sewn together. The pipes in the main factory even look like giant blood vessels of a living creature, and yet you'll just drop down these vents into these piles of failed grown grunts. It just really underlines this feeling that the systems that are actually forcing the Xenian forces through do not care, and they're just savage in their process to conquer Earth. I think the most spectacular of all the designs is the open area just before you fight the Gonark for the first time. In fact, I love Gonox Lair so much, I'm just going to give it its own segment. The original Gonok fight feels pretty bullet spongy and dull as an encounter. You fire some rockets at the Gonok and then you move to the next bit where she hunts you, you use your glue on a bunch, or your hive hand because you run out of ammo again. I mean, I get the feeling of what they're going for, like you're being hunted by this testicle spider, but it's nowhere near dynamic enough to feel like that, and the length of it just really doesn't do the mood justice. And seeing as they give you a piece of kit designed to clear the floating platforms in earlier levels, I don't know, I can understand the area is too small for some sort of jumping mechanic but for such a novel movement system, it really feels underutilized for most of the original Zen. Gonox Lair in Black Mesa fix all of those issues and then some. It tenses me up each time I play it. My palms get sweaty, knees weak, arms are heavy. Like when they lock you in place and the Gonok emerges from its nest and you think, oh fuck, that thing quite big. Oh man, it's really angry. And then the fight starts and you realize that this thing will just soak rockets like they're nothing. Then you'll see that the Gonok's actually quite fast and you understand why you need to be good at long jumping to straight it and dodge the basalt pillars that she throws at you. And then you try and hide out in the healing pool and you'll just get pummeled to death by these exploding projectiles. And then you get smacked by a sack. The Gonok fight is really hard on hard. <sighs> The Gurnock fight is really punishing. I had to knock the difficulty down for my first playthrough. Although, I'd just like to correct this for the record. Regardless of difficulty, Gonok will flinch when you hit her with explosives, which stuns her for a few seconds and helps you buy much needed time to catapult yourself into the abyss. Pro tip, get some fast damage with the gluon gun and then keep long jumping backwards while you fire rockets at her. Gonok's Lair in Black Mesa is where you have to apply everything the game's taught you so far in a high pressure environment. You start off exploring a big open arena and you hear one loud roar. I 
canister teleports in from Earth, it's full of rocket ammunition. You've played enough to know something's gonna go down. Because the fight doesn't start until you choose to start it, and you have a turn on all these switches, you get a sense of the environment. You can figure out where the earthbound canisters are, where the healing pool is, and you get a chance to practice strafing maneuvers with the long jump module. The size of the arena that Source can support means that you can really utilize the long jump mechanic here. It reminds me of the Dark Souls fight with Artorias. You need to do fast evasive movements for her bigger hitting attacks like her charge and her AoE attacks, and if you don't use the long jump module, you're straight up fucked because you won't be able to move quickly enough to evade her. And everything the game's taught you about using the environment to your advantage comes into play. A strategy that you can use in the first fight is to have her charge into a basalt pillar around the arena, which will stun her for a few seconds and allows you to get some easy hits in. When you hit her with enough damage, she'll go down on one leg as if injured, which means that you can press your advantage or use the time to stock up on health and ammo. This feels like a battle of minds as well as brute force. You have to be tactical. To plan your moves and execute them perfectly, you need to keep your distance and you need to maintain a line of fire and you need to be able to access the ammo that you'll run out of while also keeping an eye out for the several ways Gonark will ruin your life. It has this wonderful flow to it. It's punishing and it's taxing and I am here for it. But it's not just this arena. You give chase to the Gonark when it runs into its lair, then the fight becomes this really tense cat and mouse game. The thing is, even though all of this is scripted, because of the way the level design is, it really makes it feel like Gonark is an intelligent creature who's actively hunting you, the small claustrophobic caves underlining just how small you are compared to her. Most of the time is spent crawling around in caverns where you move through warrens of her den. The background sound design means you can hear the screams and rumbles of her footstep overhead. Parts of the environment that are impassable to you, she'll just smash through like they're nothing and you have to just sprint past her. In the cavern and cave systems, she'll try to dig you out with her claws and where her claws can't get to you, she'll flood the spaces with baby head crabs that will swarm you that are significantly harder to hit than regular head crabs, and she'll make this really mournful noise when you kill them. Cracks in the floor and ceiling bleed light that'll get suddenly obscured as you see her move around you, hunting you. It's sphincter tightening. I know I gushed about the music earlier, but when you crawl out of the cave and she's right there, and the beat just drops, and you're weaving through these stone alleys that the Gonok just bulldozes, and you're launching yourself with the double jump to give you that little bit of extra distance before sliding into this tiny nook, and she's just clawing at you desperately. Ah, it's so good. It all gives way to this final epic confrontation. You're strafing, you're firing everything you have at her and she's tanking every single shot. You run out of ammo and you can't restock in time, so you have to grab your next big hitter so you can stay in the fight. She'll throw you around the arena like you're made of paper, but you'll keep going and you'll keep hitting. Then the floor gives way beneath you. You're barely clinging on to life, but so is she. Her leg's shattered and armored shell is cracked. She's limping across the floor. You keep hitting her with everything that you have as this broken creature musters the last of its strength to give chase, desperately spamming acid attacks, birthing all the children that she can to just swarm you, desperately trying to defeat you before the crescendo of the music. You hit her with the last decisive hit and she explodes. You're breathless, barely alive, but you won. And the victory is so sweet. It's a culmination of this tooth and nail fight, and it feels so good. <laughs> and the thing is, even after all that you've been through, I still feel pity putting the Gonark down like this.
You know this last confrontation is technically optional too. If you're paying attention in the first Zen area, the team who came before you already figured out a way to kill the Gonark. They detailed it out on the whiteboard in the forward base. They have all these cute references to the original Gonark files, like wondering where its eyes are and the fact that it was originally nicknamed Big Mama in the files. And the scientists are named after people who worked on the mod, like Dr. Nielsen. If you carry this canister- If you carry this canister of cyanogen peroxide gas all the way through Zen and then into the first fight with the Gonark, you can take it to the- <sighs> You can take it all the way to this teleporter and then during the final chase, if you go down this passage, you'll find the area the Zen team set up to gas her and you can see the Gonark just wandering around the arena, slightly confused as to why a fight isn't happening. And then you flood the area with cyanogen. <laughs> Or not, you can just air hop out of there and leave her to wander around the arena, stewing in anger. Knowing the existence of these secret solutions really adds a layer to the whole fight. I love that they thought about how to reward players who are paying attention to the environment details or just looked at the achievements on the wiki. Black Mesa's Gonox Lair is everything I wanted from the original. It takes everything that Valve uses for their game design and applies it with new twists on the mechanics to create one of the most memorable fights in gaming. Maybe ever. Now that is how you remake a level. The final moments of the game before the fight with the Neolanth set the stage perfectly. You walk through the last two control rooms, filled with colleagues and the other oddities from Earth. At the final portal hopping across rocks, you hear the murmurs and whispers of those from back home, reminding you of everything you've been through up until this point, every fight you've pushed through, and why you're here. And now, at the top of the world, standing upon the structure that has shadowed you throughout the entire rest of the game, you look at the culmination of eight years of patience. You steal yourself and take the last jump. The fight with the Neolanth utilizes the same mechanics that they do with the Gonark. It's more of the same fast moving, dodging and timing that we'd honed down to a T before, and they make great use of the long jump mechanic to facilitate that kind of play. The developers decided to scrap Neolanth's teleporting attack from the original Half-Life, and you know what? I think it was a good move. Teleporting attack really killed the pacing of the fight, and I feel it ultimately worked against it. Here they replaced the teleport attack with the Neolanth opening portals to Black Mesa to throw cars, tanks, and even chunks of building at you out of Spite. Combined with the portal storms and energy beams created by the Neolinth, it feels like you're locked into a grueling struggle with a creature capable of holding open a bridge between dimensions. It's just one fast-paced slog that takes everything out of you. You feel the release of the final confrontation with the Neolinth as its head splits open like an egg before you deliver the killing blow. Sitting back to watch the explosion, your ordeal over before finally meeting the G-Man. Gordon Freeman in the flesh. The G-Man ending here is a real treat. It's great watching all the cool stuff they do with the engine here to make him feel like less of an interdimensional bean counter. Seeing the fully realized version of the ruins of Black Mesa, the portal that stands where the Neolith Tower once was, this bit where the tram car just reassembles around you as it floats through the ether. It's, it's just so good. I like how right up to the end, they preserve the same player agency that they gave you in Half-Life. Like you can reject his offer for work and then the G-Man will just walk out of this portal before hurling you through an all-consuming vortex that tears chunks of the train off. It's this nice mini horror segment that spits you out in a room with a big bunch of bruisers. Kevin Sisk does a really good job imitating the voices of G-Man from the original Half-Life. I mean, I would have preferred if the Half-Life 2 version was there, but I like the homage it pays to the old game having the G-Man sound like this. Good work, Kevin. You know what, in fact, good work, everyone. It really shines through how much thought and care was put into this project. At every level, Black Mesa feels like it was crafted as a true labor of love to one of the 
the best games ever made. People who would spend 15 years painstakingly going over every nook and cranny of a game that they loved and rebuilding it all in their spare time. Uh, you know, I, I've, I've played a lot of games in my life. I'm a gamer. I game. Gamed them all. But there's nothing quite like Black Mesa out there. You know, people say Black Mesa release dated, having been in development for so long, but to me, it feels just as fresh and sharp as any game released today, perhaps even more so. Crowbar Collective didn't feel unnecessarily beholden to the original work. They took liberties and altered the design in new and fun ways. It's a great demonstration of just how skilled a developer Crowbar is. If anything though, Black Mesa made me think about the testament to innovation in art and gaming. Black Mesa is perfect proof of the timelessness of Half-Life and the resilience of its simple design formula. Even with technological advancements like VR in Half-Life Alex or physics engines in Half-Life 2, the ability to interact with everything in Half-Life Alex is VR and needing to catch ammo you move towards you is just a more high-tech version of Half-Life letting you ruin someone's lunch. Both experiences are underpinned by the same design ethos that allows players to interact with levels in believable and memorable ways. It's still hitting me that 22 years on, the whole industry lives in the shadow of a game made by a handful of plucky designers in Washington state that we've somehow managed to slide backwards in the experiences we craft for players. It's a shame we don't see more games like Half-Life. It came at a time when the industry was still finding its feet and these sorts of decisions felt like risks. But now gaming is a huge financial sink and it feels more like they're doing things to minimize risk, creating bland experiences for players to just trudge through because a spreadsheet said it was profitable. They just don't make games like Half-Life anymore. And I think that alone is reason enough for Black Mesa to exist. I think Crowbar Collective did something wonderful. They polished up Half-Life, sanded off the rough edges, transformed what needed transforming, and kept the pieces that were worth keeping. And I want to thank them for just showing me how good games can be, for giving me the ability to experience games like Half-Life for the first time. I just think it's worth remembering, Black Mesa is genius, because Half-Life is genius. Fuck, that should have been the title! Oh, hey, you're still here. Uh, right, uh, thanks for watching all the way through. It, it means a lot. I really enjoyed making this. I may have gone too far in a few places. I hope the audio mixing is better in this one. I'm sorry to the guy whose wife got woke up by it last time. I hope she, I hope she got a good night's sleep, mate. Uh, oh, I need to give some special thanks here. Uh, that Trav guy's notes on Valve's design pillars from his Half-Life video were really useful. Uh, sorry for flat out stealing your first example. It, it honestly wasn't intentional. I, I think my brain just like indexed it away and I forgot until it came time to do this. Um, Simon Roth's notes on Half-Life's AI were also really good, and same with Marfitimus Blackimus. Uh, the links to their stuff is in the description. Uh, God bless all of you. Also, thanks to the Let's Players Shiriko and Zevik. Their Half-Life footage for Surface Tension was really useful for me to show what I meant about Half-Life 1's blocking geometry. Uh, also, thanks for the Dark Souls footage. I only have Dark Souls on the 360, so... Uh, two clicks Philip for non-HD model footage of Half-Life as well. And of course, thanks very much to Sexy Nutella, whose Black Mesa footage is just incredible. Uh, their footage for Gonox Lair dropped as I was nearing the end of this, and it's honestly just so good. They did a thousand recordings for the first Gonok fight to get it just right. Like, holy shit. I thought I was a perfectionist. Uh, I feel like interloper is gonna break him as a chapter. Sexy Nutella is proof that there is no natural justice because they're easily one of the best Let's Players on YouTube and they've got almost no attention. Like, go and subscribe to them right now. Um, I think that's everyone credited who, who needs a credit. Uh, all the names of the people uh, whose videos help make this exist are up here. If they're not, then obviously feel free to yell at me. Uh, also, thanks to my patrons too. Their doodles should be coming up on the screen now. Oh yeah, I have a, I have a patron. Um, there's nothing there. I don't have anything extra for you guys yet. Uh, please don't give me money. 
But, I mean, if, if you want to give me money, then you can do that. Uh, also, thanks to my first ever patron, LaDude. Uh, your giving me one pound has been immortalized forever in the credits as the primordial soup of my Patreon. Yeah, a custom doodle isn't a thing for their tier, but also they're like my first backer. I mean, how many people can say that they're the first person to donate to my Patreon? Only one, and it's LaDude. Uh, patrons got to see an early cut of this video and give me notes on it. Notes like, yep, pretty good. Some of the jokes were meh, but an interesting analysis. Thanks for the notes, gang. Nah, I'm just kidding. Like, they were, they're actually really, really good notes, and I genuinely appreciate them. Thank you so much. This still feels very H-bomb adjacent, like bordering on derivative. I actually had a joke in, in the older version where I spliced together audio uh, where they call it derivative, but I cut it because, well, I mean, well. Cringe. There is no other word for it. This makes me cringe. It's embarrassing. Yeah, please, please don't watch this, Harris. I mean, unless you like it, then watch it. Well, I mean, I guess you wouldn't know you hate it unless you, you watch it. And, and you did pop up in my comment section that one time. So... Hi, Harris. You come here often? I'm, 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 I'm gonna lie down. Uh, thanks again, everyone, and I will see you at some time.